Oh, Suzanne's ready. All right. Limbering up. <laughs> Limbering up the back. And you go on. That's great. Okay. All right. All well, right. Everybody on to... mute, please, except for Amy. Oh, yes. And uh, me? Control, what about me? <laughs> the control of that. All right. Well, listen here. Kathy, you're on admitting, and I'm going to go over to share. I got Again, it. For those of you who have never joined us before, we are the only people on Zoom that have a theme song. <laughs> so here we go. Let's hope it's in the right spot. Ready? Well, it's the end of the week. Now where you've been? Well, now it's Feedback Friday, so come on in. Come sit down and stare at your screen. We've got a presenter that you've never seen. We're Feedback Friday. We're on the loose. We'll be the train. You be the caboose. It's Feedback Friday with Kathy and Amy. Mashed potatoes and the gravy. It's Feedback Friday all day long. Feedback, Feedback, Feedback Friday. I think that, uh, let me stop this. Whoa. Uh, we don't want Joan Armitrading to suddenly go hurt. Joan, but uh, hello yeah. everyone. Uh, Bless you who sneezed. <laughs> Thanks Suzanne. And I believe she has wristbands on today. Oh yeah. That's so eighties. Cool. Oh, I thought I saw no? red. So, so. Oh. All right. I thought it was along with our theme song. Well, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are joining us from. This is Feedback Friday. I'm Kathy Hattori. And guess what? Today is episode number 28. And really, I only have one question is that I hope you are either registered to vote, are going to vote, or have voted. Because it's super important this year. Super important. Um, let's see, you all know who I am. I'm the president of Botanical Colors and along with Amy Dufo, our director of sustainability and social media, we are here to bring you yet another amazing presenter. Um, and what else am I supposed to tell you? I'm looking at my notes here. Oh yeah, um, Botanical Colors provides natural dyes online and also we have a custom dye house here based in Seattle, Washington. Um, it's been very interesting going through production when you're social distancing, but it's still happening. So that's the good news. Um, today, our presenter is Lee Magar from Madam Magar in um, Johns Island, South Carolina, which is part of kind of just outside Charleston. Um, Madame Magar is a textile design studio inspired by art, history, folkways, and nature. The studio embraces a seed to stitch design philosophy that explores the history of a rich yet tangled past of a place while living and working on a former indigo plantation. And um, Lee is going to talk a little bit about like the amazing riches that she's discovered on this property. Um, before we start, though, I just want to send out a huge thank you to everybody. You have endured with us for 28 sessions of our group textile therapy. And I have to say, everybody is doing a real good job. Feels like you're handling the issues very nicely. Uh, for a little housekeeping, Amy's our moderator. And she's gonna monitor the chat on this call. And um, just so you all know, typically we kind of hang out afterward, um, but we are, we are closing at the hour and Amy is just zooming off. So we're not gonna have any um, chat time afterwards, but we will do it again next time. Um, the call's being recorded. Yes, I hit the record button. <laughs> And uh, we will have a video copy ready for you, along with any uh, references, resources, links, things that you ask about um, in the chat. So we're just going to go ahead and seg into Lee Magar and her presentation. Welcome, Lee. Thanks so much for joining us from Charleston. And take it away. 
Hey everyone, thank you. Thank you so much. I really uh, appreciate you um, asking me to be here. I just am a huge Feedback Friday fan. And um, I want to thank um, not only you, but all of the amazing presenters that you've had because I've learned so much about their storytelling and it's been such an inspiration for me. And I want to thank everyone who's watching and listening for being interested in my Indigo story. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so I'll start my slideshow. One of those moments, Lee, like, like I said, all of a sudden Zoom's like, eh, I'll throw you a curveball. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Getting all the photos ready. Okay, voila. Okay, can everyone see me? See my see my photographs? Yeah. Okay, as Kathy said so beautifully, um, my name is Lee Magar and I have a textile art design studio called Madame Magar. And uh, I just wanna say that what I'm about to, to tell everyone as um, a sacred and spiritual um, part of my Indigo story. And some of the things that I talk about may seem made up or like a fairy tale, but um, everything is true and I'm just really happy to share it. Um, I live on Johns Island, South Carolina. It's a rural sea island outside of Charleston, South Carolina. And in 2015, I moved to this, um, uh, not to brag, but just to give everyone a sense of um, a sense of uh, the intensity of my place is 500 acres of untouched uh, beauty and land. So after moving to this um, untouched, beautiful part of uh, nature, I felt so inspired to work with Mother Nature in a creative sense. And um, this is one of the first dye plants that I've found and this is a uh, Simplicos. And um, I didn't realize that it was a dye plant until after I attended Michelle Garcia's workshop. And because I was calling it by its common name, which is horse sugar. And then after I returned home and I was reading his notes, I realized that this was Simplicos plant that he was raving about and that he had done um, multiple studies with and that is used for a uh, mordant. Um, so I was all inspired by nature and um, I began to uh, research where I live um, to study the history of the plantations uh, with uh, rice, indigo and cotton. And I began to read about the history of those uh, crops and I became um, very inspired by indigo and the history of South Carolina indigo specifically. So I felt the desire to, um, to work with indigo and um, learn about indigo, all things indigo. And um, I studied and read the letters of Eliza Lucas Pigney and was really inspired by her vision to grow indigo. And um, soon thereafter, I said, I'm gonna grow indigo. I have plenty of land to do it. And that's what I'm gonna do. So at the time, 2015, uh, the indigo fera superdicosa seeds were really hard to find, but I found them. Um, I was able to find them through a monk and our hermit, here he is, 
who has been growing the plant for almost 20 years. And so I was very fortunate to uh, get those seeds. I call them the holy seeds. Mm -hmm. And um, so I planted, that's my first crop in 2015. Wow. And um, I had a lot of indigo and a lot of seeds. So it inspired me to create a seed to stitch project where I would uh, grow uh, plants to die with and also gather plants from where I live and work with that to create um, to create one of a kind dresses and home goods, accessories and textile art. And um, this is one of the paths that I was inspired by where I live and um, just beyond these oak trees, one day I was walking in the woods and this was after I planted Indigo Ferra Super Dicosa. This was a year later. I um, discovered a hidden uh, field of our wild native indigo, which is called Indigo Ferra Caroliniana. And I was led to the secret indigo field by a blue dragonfly. So at that moment, I felt a calling to work with indigo. This is the wild native indigo, indigo ferra caroliniana that I've been nurturing and using and um, gathering the seeds and replanting. And as you can see, it's a smaller plant than the indigo ferra superdicosa. Um, it's more like a bush and um, the leaves are, are smaller to work with also. But I keep finding it everywhere in the woods. So it's such a blessing to have. And I gather these plants very responsibly and gracefully as it's very important to me to preserve them. Um, this is one of my first dresses, of course, dyed with indigo. And some of my um, baskets I use, the scrap of my uh, dresses, I use to make uh, ring baskets that are made with dress scrap and twine. And here's some recent um, textile art pieces that are just all little pieces of indigo dyed scrap because um, I spend so much time, um, you know, in the indigo field and working with indigo and so much work dyeing the cloth that I want to save every little piece of scrap. So those are my indigo rag dolls. And this is one of my textile art um, exhibits um, in Tryon, North Carolina, which is the birthplace of Nina Simone, um, who uh, I grew up not far from her hometown and I was invited uh, to participate in this group exhibit in 2016. And this was my first scrap silhouette because they wanted something to put in the uh, gallery window. So I was so, I'm so inspired by quilt making. Um, I had a, a great aunt, Evangeline, who was a quilter and a dressmaker. So she is such a huge inspiration in my work. So I decided to create a, a quilt-like silhouette of Nina Simone with scrap indigo. And this is the exhibit, the gallery window where it was placed. And this is an exhibit, it, it's called, I call these exhibits because they're in storefront windows, my makeshift studio exhibits. And I love um, creating studios and uh, storefront windows because they're accessible for people off the sidewalk to see the work in progress. I just think they're so fun. And so this was a piece I did for um, an art festival in King Street. And um, King Street was a, a, I guess it was a booming tobacco town. And, you know, of course now it's, um, you know, in dire straits. Um, and so uh, a woman who is from uh, Kings Tree, Darla Moore, uh, she is a businesswoman and she created this art festival to generate businesses 
in the town. And so for my um, exhibit and my work um, for the, for the, for the um, festival, I created a silhouette of her and she grew up on a tobacco farm. So I dyed the scrap cloth with tobacco and you can see the background is of course indigo and this is all hand stitched and it took I think two weeks I was in the window stitching every day and it's a huge piece of cloth and originally it was you know just going to be a quilt and but now I decided to use it as a picnic blanket because it's so big and it's perfect for that I love it and this is the South Carolina state flag that I did for, for the South Carolina State Museum. And it was a year long project where I set up a studio in the museum and stitched this um, flag because uh, the original South Carolina flag was there. So I decided to go with that, that theme. And I, um, it took me a year because it's, it's in Columbia. So I, I drove there from Charleston. It's a few hour drive. And um, I would go there like three days a week, a month. So it was a year long project. And um, the really interesting um, thing about this project was that I, I don't know if you all heard about tragedy in Charleston, South Carolina of the um, AME uh, shooting where nine African-American lives were um, killed by a white supremacist. That was such a, a tragedy and it, it really shook up um, our world in Charleston. And while I was at the um, South Carolina State Museum stitching the South Carolina flag, the um, and I came down finally from the South Carolina State Building, which was around the corner from where I was, and they moved it to the State Museum while I was there stitching. And it was just unbelievable. So, but it was such a, a blessing to finally have that awful flag down. And tra travel is such an inspiration for me, and that's one of the main things that I miss right now, um, this is in uh, India, in India, such an eye-opening experience. I urge um, all of you, if you haven't been to India, go to India, you know, when we're able to travel again. It's just such a, a rich, beautiful place, especially for textile work. And this is a special place called Aranya Naturals, where I spent a weekend working with them and um, here I am uh, with the indigo vat and the indigo dyer. It was such a special place. And this is um, a jar of, of extracting my fresh leaf. And I think one of the reasons that I do what I do is because my love and obsession for jars and jugs, I just love to use those. And um, I, I know I get that from a fond memories of being with my grandma who had a garden and she uh, canned her vegetables and beautiful mason jars. So that's where that beauty comes from. Uh, these are my coastal, coastal coasters that are made with twine and indigo scrap and dresses that I sell at worthwhile, shopworthwhile.com. This is, as you can see, an indigo dipped dress and a jacket with silk indigo. And there's a, a jacket that was um, from last season that um, you can see the inspiration of the quilt and the hand um, me in India at the, uh, at the uh, most amazing, one of my most inspiring artists, uh, Yayo Kusama. And I just really um, was inspired by Japan. And this is one of the 
dresses that I made after that trip. And there's another kind of uh, apron top that I made after Japan. And these are some historical vats that are not far from me. And they um, were used during the 1700s, during the uh, indigo plantation times. And I wanna talk um, more about Eliza. Um, a couple of years ago, I realized that I had been putting Eliza on the pedestal and it was time for her to come down that she was credited for bringing indigo to South Carolina and making it a huge cash crop, but it was the work, the painstaking work um, and knowledge of the enslaved who made South Carolina indigo a huge cash crop. So I wanted to, I felt the desire to tell that truth and to honor and acknowledge them. Uh, this is my um, crop this year, the 2020 season that I just harvested all of the indigo, so it's over. But this year I decided to do something a little different with the field. I decided to kind of um, not keep it as manicured as previous years. And I kind of let the uh, natural flora and fauna intertwine with the field. And it was just so beautiful. I kind of, you know, let go with it. Um, and this is also where I am now at the moment. And this is um, a method that uh, was inspired by Abi Bukhar Fafana and through his teachings, I decided that this was the right uh, method for me, for where I live and for uh, using fresh indigo, um, making indigo, dry leaf indigo patties from uh, my field and using them in my fermentation vats. And this is my summer fermentation vat that I just keep outside. I don't need to heat it or anything in the, in the summertime. And this is made with Indigo Ferra Caroliniana and also Sucreticosa. I, I call it sort of the melting pot vat. I kind of like threw, it, threw in you know, everything I had, you know, to use it all for the season. So, and I originally started this fat with henna um, and then I transformed it into a fermentation vat. And, and the fermentation process is such a slower process. It's, it's such a beautiful process. And it, it was so um, nurturing for me to learn this process um, this season because of COVID I had, um, you know, the energy and, and the time I feel like with COVID, I have um, sort of taken everything a little slower, you know, that has really opened my eyes to, to what's important and what's vital in my life. So it's been, you know, a beautiful thing for that. And um, with the aid of Catherine Ellis, who is a huge inspiration, she um, kind of coached me with fermentation. And I want to thank her for all, all of her work. Um, and Abby Mukar Fafana also has been such a godsend and an inspiration. And here I am now, I'm in Japan there, but um, now I'm at the part of my, uh, I guess, life and work that now that I have the technical part of Indigo, um, sort of under my belt, I feel like I can really let go with it and um, have fun and let it flow uh, like a stream and a river and a beautiful blue sea. So thank you all so much for listening to my Indigo story. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Lee. Wow. Thank you. So beautiful. <laughs> So Thank very you. beautiful. Um, I think I we, just opened yeah, the chat. Yeah, chat's open. So chat's open. if anybody sure. has a question, Lee, I have a question for you. Um, you yeah, so with the, <laughs> the Carol Liniana, is that what it's called? That in yes. 
are you finding like there's a different quality between that and the sufructicosa in the dipping that you do? And if so, what's that difference? Well, as um, you know, the historical accounts that I've read about it say that it's inferior to oh. sufructicosa and tinctoria. And my feeling since I've been working with the plant for five years is that it's not inferior, inferior, it's different and unique. It's smaller, I, I think because it's a smaller leaf and a smaller plant that it didn't have as much color as using the larger leaves, right. you know? Mm -hmm. So that got uh, mistakenly confused. So I feel like it's, I really am embracing it. And I love the color because I've gotten a lot of unusual tones with it. I've gotten some uh, more uh, turquoisey blues, which I love, and um, also some lilac hues mm. with it. Mm -hmm. So I, I really love working with it. And, um, you know, it's pretty rare and I think it's almost extinct because of development. So that's one of the reasons I love uh, working with it and preserving it and nurturing it. So I'm just so happy to have found that plant. Are you saving seed and are you, you know, like putting seed in seed saving type banks or things like that? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, this is, I just planted some last season closer to my house just so I could, you know, kind of monitor, monitor it closer, you know, look at it and and see what it's doing. And um, it is very hard to cultivate. I'll tell you, it's harder than the others, but I am saving seed and preserving and nurturing. You know, um, at this time, I'm not gonna sell seed, but maybe in the future when we have mm -hmm. a lot more. Right. So but it is it's such a beautiful plan and I'm just so happy. I keep finding it everywhere. Every time I walk in the woods. Now your eyes are open. That's great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah, I love Lee that how when we we were talking the other day too, you had so much going on in in your yard yard from the simplicos to the indigo to the vats to the hemp wild hemp you're finding. It's like the silkworms, crazy, right? Crazy yeah. Crazy we're gonna yeah, this force is, her to make it like this, a um, national landmark or something. This is the little jar of simplicos the ground, and I'll show you the leaves. And oh, here's a little bouquet that I picked this morning of our native nice. wildflower. All right, we got lots yeah, of I questions just, coming in for you, Lee. This is the silk. Oh God, bouquet. the silk pods, right. Look at those. There's Take one of those out, Lee, and show them. Show everybody. Okay. These I find every time I walk and I find them on the oak trees. Yeah, and they're silk, silk pods. Wild silk. And I didn't realize it until I was in India and I was at the Calico Museum and I saw these wild silk cocoons and I was like, oh my Lord, I have those. That's awesome. And yeah, the Calico Museum was a huge inspiration for the dressmaking. And here's one indigo one. Of course, that's gonna go in the vat. Yeah, I wanna dye all of them. Don't, save some of them. <laughs> All yeah. right, so um, Lee, I'm just gonna, these questions are, are coming in. So can you talk about how you make those indigo patties, the little patties or your little Yeah, cakes? Yeah, they're, they're pretty simple. And I love making those because they remind me of like crab cakes or crab patties, you know, it's a similar process. And that's one reason I do what I do for my love of cooking. I, I feel like it's related um, so basically just, um, you saw the wooden mortar and pestle. I use that, I pick the leaves first and you have to pick every little leaflet. So it is a lot of work. And um, I started last season an Indigo Farm Exchange project and me and a, a woman, Carrie Tucker, we spent this whole season, all we did was make those indigo patties this whole season. So um, I haven't weighed them yet. I'm a little afraid to weigh them <laughs> because, you know, they condense. 
you know, so it's not going to be a lot of patties. So anyway, you just harvest the leaves and then you um, pound them in the mortar and pestle and shape them into the patties. I, a lot of people like the woad balls are made, uh, you know, as balls, the European woad balls, they make them into balls. And I know Abby Bukhar makes them into balls. That's the typical method. But because where I live is very humid and um, nothing dries, I chose to make them, you know, into patties so they'll dry. And so that's what I do and I dry them in the sun. And then you can save them for a couple of years. And I'm doing the fermentation vat, so I just throw them into that. And it's, it's easy. So. Awesome. Uh, and I will be teaching some uh, workshops, hopefully, next season, some indigo live, field thing. Live. Hopefully, or, live. Yeah. hopefully live. And I'm going to do some indigo field harvest workshops, some indigo field to fabric workshops. And they'll be very small um, and intimate. So if you're interested, just, you know, contact me and I'll send you details. Hey, we'll put that in the resource on the resource list. Ooh. Okay, that will well, that'll be on the post that I put up later. Uh, classes. Okay, so uh, Patricia Massey says, "Can you talk about the garments behind you?" Oh yeah, sure. Thank you for your interest. Um, these are fall frocks that I'm working on, and slowly but surely. <laughs> I don't know if you can see. Can you see? Yes, we can see. All in spider by quilt making. My favorite is that blue one with that. Oh yeah, I didn't have time to finish. Diane Becker is, I bet, thinking the same thing. This is really long. I, I you know, when I made it, I, I love doing long uh, dresses in the winter time, you know? So, but the black sometimes feels a little witchy, you know what I mean? Which is not good. <laughs> um, and this is a jacket, like you saw in the photos, which is one of my favorite with the elbows. And this is all indigo dyed thread. So it's a lot of work. You gotta love it, right? Uh, this is the, the glue one that I made with the, uh, I dyed with the fermentation vat. And it gets so deep. The fermentation vat is such a deep blue, I love it. Lee, is that tobacco like the other, the kind of lighter? This, this this gold? Yeah, the gold. That I um, used uh, Simplicos. Uh, Simplicos. Tea. We have a Charleston tea company here. Oh. Tea and some other secret ingredients. Ah, <laughs> okay. So somebody here is asking about uh, contact. They want to go to India next summer. Can you give me a contact in Oran Orangia? Orangia? But Orangia Naturals. We can put that in the, the resource list too. I'm just going to write it down quick. All right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah what, that's the name? Best. Yeah. I'm sorry. Going too fast today. I got to slow the roll. Yeah. Yeah. Aranya Naturals is such a, a beautiful place. And, and it's working with the, um, the, the um, people there that are, um, I can't remember the name, but anyway, um, they have an Instagram page, Aranya Naturals. It, it was such a spiritual experience for me. And I think for most creative um, people that it would be an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us the name of the tobacco town that had the, the gallery? Yeah, um, it's called Kings Tree, South Carolina. And they have a festival called Art Fields every year. And of course, this year it was virtual, um, but it's just to promote the economy in this tiny town, you know. Uh, so it's a good thing. It's a really good thing. Mm -hmm. Very creative place. The hangings that you did are like, um, yeah, the, the two different hang, the, the pieces that you did that were yeah. in the gallery. Um, let's see, were they quilted or were they like an applique that you sewed, sewed down? 
Um, really, yeah, Sheila's asking, were the hangings quilted applique? Mm, well, I mean, they're, I would say both. I mean, it's, it's, it's quilted, but it's not like the typical quilt, quilt where there's batting. I just kind of layered the fabric. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. And it all hands them. So not not like the typical quilt. So I take these things, these amazing homespun techniques the, in folk ways that I'm inspired by, but I want to kind of turn them upside down because that's the interesting part mm -hmm. of it to, to see things in a different a different light. So I love that part of my work. It keeps it really new and exciting. Mm -hmm. Can you, uh, hi Damien, uh, what is your process for using the jars? Uh, the jars are kind of like my little test trials, you know, just to, just because I love the way the indigo extraction looks to see that I call it the purple, you know, I call it the royal scum. And, <laughs> and so I love to see that and, and just love to see, you know, the evolution of that process, even though I don't really do that process because it doesn't make sense for the amount of indigo that I grow. And it's just me and one other person working in the field. So it's hard for me to do everything. So I really, for me, it makes sense to do the dried leaf process. Um, Gage says, I used to live in South Carolina and I've read about Eliza Pinckney too. Thank you for acknowledging the slave workers. Um, Thank you for that. Yeah, it's very important. I felt like um, before it was never um, talked about. And I, I think that's one of the good things about what's happening now is we're feeling so much pain that we're opening up spiritually and we're talking about these pains and moving forward from the darkness to the light. And that's where I am now with my work. And I'm actually um, from the seeds, seed to stitch project um, from the seed cells, the indigo seed cells that will be available at Botanical Colors. <laughs> um, from those seed cells, the proceeds will go to a local foundation called Darkness to Light which um, is committed to, um, to, uh, to uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know it was abused. I think it was abused. To uh, sexual, yeah, to yeah. prevent yeah. child sexual abuse. I'm sorry, it's just really painful to talk about these issues, you know, yeah. but it's important. Thank they you. They are important, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of issues that are just so heavy right now. And, and we're all, I think, forced to talk about so many of them that it's it's a weight. So whatever we can all do to donate or to support things, it's it's really important right now. Yeah, yeah. And I really appreciate what y'all are doing, Botanical Colors is doing, um, donating to artisans which are in need because it's, mm -hmm. it's hard. It's hard to, to survive, you know? <laughs> Yeah. especially all. Yep. Thank you for saying that. So um, Tina is wondering, what is your preferred substrate to work with for garment construction? I'm sorry, say it again. Uh, what, is, what is your preferred substrate to work with for garment construction? Or maybe like talking about the different materials that you use when you're okay. constructing garments. Oh, okay. Well, um, of course, I love the hand stitching and uh, using indigo dipped thread, but of course, all natural f fibers. But recently, I've been obsessed with linen. I feel like for me, linen dyes so beautifully. So that's what I use now. And silk, you know, silk is so easy, right? Mm -hmm. And um, cotton, I love cotton. I started off with really basic muslin. And for next spring, I'm already thinking about going back to that because I just love the basic uh, fabrics and the feel. And then, you know, it's what you do to the fabric that makes it unique. So, mm. so I try yeah, to keep I that part of it. Great. Yeah. 
Lynn has such a great feel, especially here in the summer, it's so hot. So you mm -hmm. can't really wear much, but that linen feels good. Yeah. Um, let's see, Helen and Helen Kennedy is saying, I have your seeds growing in Portland, Oregon. It's been fun on social media. We get, we get tagged a lot on everybody's plants once they start growing and, you know, early summer, mid summer. So I've definitely seen pictures of the seed, of your seeds growing in different places, which has been fun. Let's Wonderful. See. I'm so happy to hear that because like yeah. I said, there's uh, the seeds are holy seeds, you know, they're from the monk and the hermit. So really, that was a really cool happy picture that you had of the monk with his, his closed eyes and his, your story that yeah. you were talking Matthew the other day. We're like, what, what do you mean the monk? I know. I can't believe some of the things that have happened to me. I mean, it's truth. And it, like, I, I was afraid that none of you would believe me, but anyway, I just felt it necessary to talk about the truth and um, I hope I don't get in trouble for showing that photograph of him. <laughs> well, well, Kathy, can you delete that part out when, when we uh, <laughs> just edit? You have time to do that, right? Well, I'll edit it, it. it and we'll okay. just put in an mm, yeah. <laughs> or, during that period. Or, so you'll be fine. just laughing crazy. I'm like, what? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, don't, <laughs> I, I don't think he'll be on the botanical color site. Yeah, probably not. He's probably yeah, right. I don't think we'll get a flame from our social media post. <laughs> yeah. Oh okay. my gosh, that would um, be fun. So Deanna is asking, I'm so curious about your Carolina indigo. Do you know if it's, um, if it's native, I'm sure, native to North America or was it brought here? It's native, it's native. And uh, yeah, indigo fera Carolina. It's wild and native. <laughs> All right. So pretty cool. The, let's see. Okay, I planted some of your seeds for indigo here in central Florida. It loves this weather, it seems. I got a lot of late start in planting, though. Will this plant die back in this climate to where I need to reseed it next year? Um, at Florida, I mean, you should be all right. I mean, it just depends on the winter time because um, here I have the same issue. If it's a very cold and I get a lot of freezes, it dies. But um, like this past season, it came back beautifully. So it just depends on the weather. And I would just, I'm usually overboard about it and safe. So I do all methods with the seeds. I do seedlings and I'd throw them on the ground, you know, just want some indigo. So I, I play, you know, I try to cover all my bases in that. So that's what I recommend. But if you're in Florida, it should, should come back if it's not too cold in the winter. So you shouldn't have a problem with that. I mean, it's the perfect place to grow it in Florida, really is. Just like it is in the Northeast. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you could grow it in Cape Cod. <laughs> yeah, Barbara's gonna grow it up there in, uh, in Maine. Okay, are there any books that you could you could suggest that um, on indigo history, Lee? Yeah, this is a perfect one. How many times are we all seeing this book and we keep saying, I got to read that book? Yeah. Everybody says it. We've got to read that book, though. Maybe we should start a book club. Yeah, that Maybe would be amazing. Thing. Oh, thumbs up. Oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah, it's say. amazing. Um, this book is exactly what I've been talking about the whole time mm -hmm. and this talks about exactly where I live which after I found the wild indigo I found out was an indigo plantation I didn't know that when I moved there you know none of this I knew coming into this place so it's been been really amazingly intense mm -hmm. so um, okay, let's see. Um, thank you so much for the inspiring presentation. Would love to know more about your garment making. Are all your garments hand stitched? Do you make your own patterns? Well, I take uh, old patterns. I have a big collection of vintage patterns and I take them and change them. Um, so that's how I work. And uh, I do a lot of hand sewing. I actually do the form with a machine but all the top stitching I do by hand. And I love that part of it because it's like meditation.
for me is, is therapeutic. And I love that hand stitching part, even though it's very, very slow. Um, but I do love it. And um, I sell very limited, one of a kind seasonal dresses at Shop Worthwhile. That, that place has been around. I mean, I think I saw it on your slide since 1993, but I yeah. love like a 1993 or, you know, that was such yeah. a great shop. It, it still is a great shop. Yeah, so, I'm, I'm fortunate to be there. Yeah. So a couple people are asking about the those, uh, your little patties, your little blue patties. Are they just leaves and water? Um, yeah, actually, is it is it just leaves and water? Are just, they just, le just leaves, no water, just okay. leaves, just leaves pounded. Okay. Very cool, yeah, just leaves. I like the simplicity of that too. I'm trying to go very, very simple. You know, indigo is wonderful, but it can be overwhelming, right? Mm -hmm. So now I'm so happy that I feel like I have, I have experimented with all things indigo, right? And Kathy, you know this, right? First hand. And um, now I'm just <laughs> Kathy, <laughs> Kathy, where we all have like, we all have indigo on. Kathy has been doing so much indigo for Eileen Fisher. And so we're, we're like kind of all wearing indigo all the time now because of because we get all of our clothes messed up and then we just have to dip them. Just dip them, dip them in the indigo vat. Dip them in the indigo. Yeah. And I nice, mean, it's, yeah, it keeps us centered though too. You know, I keep going downstairs to my indigo vat and I stir it up and it's like, can't be with you today, buddy. But hopefully this weekend we're going to be together. But yeah. uh, so Can I just wait. answer a chat question about sure. the patties? So Sheila, you're asking about the leaves. Basically you have a, a mortar and a pestle and you're putting the leaves in the mortar and pestle and you are crushing them. You're just crushing them into a thick paste, right? It's like, like this, like a what? Pesto. Yeah, like pesto. <laughs> and then you take them out and you form them into patties and then you dry them. Do you dry them in the sun or do you dry yeah. them in the shade? Dry them in the sun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, like I said, I hope to have workshops in the future on that because it's so fun. You love it. <laughs> have you ever tried it like in a blender or you know, food processor? Yeah, I did the first season. I did this a few years ago and I did it in a blender, but it, it, it stayed green. It didn't change to that uh, blue. Yeah. And Abby Car told me you have to use a mortar and pestle. Yeah, you're but really bruising the leaves. You have and getting... to really for that force. But yeah. Catherine said, I'm not doing that. She uses a processor. I don't know how she does it, but she, she uses makes a patties as well. Yeah, she makes them. Uh, remember, she was talking about her fermentation vat. She makes dried patties with, you know, just a little indigo that she grows. Uh -huh. and that to the vat but um you can try it i mean you got to try it. you know if you right. really you can try it you know we but encourage me, experimentation you guys yeah, um, yeah. someone else is asking about dry, just drying the leaves and if any of you have a copy of john marshall's book singing the blues i think it's called um he has different methods for drying persicaria which is what we often refer to as Japanese indigo. Lee, in your experience, can you dry uh, your type of indigo? And if so, what happens? Yeah, you can dry it. I dry it. I dry some, but, but for me, the patties are easier because they get small, they're condensed, they're easy to store. Mm -hmm. Last season, I, what I did the whole season was dry my indigo and I had um, paper bags full of indigo in the guest room, like all over. So my problem is I don't really have the storage for that, you know, but yeah, you can dry the indigo, but you just got to make sure um, that there's airflow um, with them. I just kind of hung mine in a dark place indoors because we have, also we have a humidity problem. So, you know, it's very hard to dry things, but um, if you have a garage or something, you can just lay a tarp down and put them on top of that tarp. I, I have a friend, actually a monk, he, he does that method. 
-hmm. and he dries his. So yeah, you can dry them. Did you say you have a friend who is a monk? I I meant to say my friend monk. monk. (laughs) Like how many monks do you know? That's the only one is what I'm talking about. (laughs) (laughs) You have like all, you have a whole stable of monks. Yeah, yeah, Uh, I live on a ferry in the woods. Oh man, we have so many questions. Like we're gonna, Leah, hopefully, you know, like we say every single week, you know, we can maybe get you to answer some of the questions we're not gonna get to today. And and I'll include them in, our, in the blog post. And you guys always go back and check those blog posts. There's the first edition and then there's the second edition when the, when the uh, questions, the, the answers come in. So can you talk about the process of dyeing larger pieces of cloth? And do you have like a gigantic vat that you're dyeing these? large pieces of cloth in well um that is definitely not a question for me i i know a lot of people will be shocked by this i love dying in small vessels small jars small jugs i like the wabi sabi and evenness of dying so i'm not I'm not looking for that perfection. You know, I am really celebrating the beauty of imperfection, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> and, um, but at the same time, I really um, am aiming to do a beautiful piece uh, quality wise, right? So my vats that I showed you in the slideshow, those are 10 gallons each. So 15 gallons is the max that I will do It's so funny, when I first started, I did a 25 gallon fermentation vat. That was my first indigo vat. And now I think, what was I doing? (laughs) (laughs) So I urge people who are starting out to start small because it takes a lot of time, you know, just to, you know, uh, develop a relationship with the indigo vat and to learn, you know, for me, it took a long time. So so I always tell people that are interested in uh, working with the indigo, start small. And I also have a five gallon jug that I love. That's like my favorite bat. So I, I don't really, um, I, I feel stressed if I, I go large. I feel like I have to use all that indigo, you know? And it's kind of stressful for me as a very limited designer, you know, when, woman show it's not it's not meant for me i like when i I know a bunch of people that are on here took abu bakar's or have taken a class with abu bakar with us but i know when he talks about that blue of nothingness you know like when your vats like getting really really uh, you know it's really there's not much left in it but and and how easy it is to get this color here i'm like yeah it's actually just the opposite Uh, for me when i'm doing it but Anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love the pale blues the best, which is rare. Most people like the deep blues mm-hmm. and um, at, at, uh, at uh, the um, Abby Bukhar's workshop at Botanical Colors that I went to years ago, that was, um, you know, a, a huge change in my, my indigo work because he really taught, uh, you know, taught me to go slow with it and to um, the way we dipped the shades of blue from uh, darkness to light. And that was just really amazing to experience that. I learned so much from him. I urge anyone out there who has not taken his class, you've got to take his class. He's an amazing teacher. Kathy will talk about that after. But um, okay, so I'm going to combine a couple questions here and a couple people are asking about growing from seed and do you have use a specific type of like plant spacing and um, just kind of any tips you can offer about growing from seed? Yeah, I like I said, I choose to do it, use the seed all each and every way possible. I start seedlings and doors and I throw seed out um, in the field and um, and sometimes the indigo comes back. But I usually, if I'm setting in the seedlings, I usually space the one to three feet apart, uh, probably like two and a half feet apart is what I usually do. 
And like I said, this season, I sort of had a different approach and I kind of let the native plants kind of intertwine with the field and they love, they really flourish that. You know, I, I feel like with indigo and most plants, you kind of got to let go, you know, and that's really indigo, right? Letting go. Yeah. It's a moody little, moody little thing, <laughs> indigo. Yeah. Um, yeah. How about one more question, which is besides everybody now wanting to start a book club. Great, Kathy. Uh, yeah. Okay. Do you um, do you have a pattern book, <laughs> a pattern book that you could um, point point a couple people to that are asking about kind of patterns and stuff? I know like Natalie Channon has always has patterns inside her books, but would that be a book yeah. that you would suggest? Yeah, Natalie Shannon. Is, is, has a great um, pattern making book. Um, I really can't think of anything on the top of my head. I, like I said, I've just had these patterns. You know, I'm a collector and a gatherer. And um, one of the reasons I make dresses is because I've always loved dresses and I've always collected dresses. So that's really the inspiration. So, you know, um, so I don't really have a standard book that I use. I just have those vintage patterns. <laughs> I was just thinking about, I have this really great pattern book. It's all Japanese patterns kind of. Oh like, yeah, but, yeah. Those but all are of a sudden, good. yeah, like Helen just put Japanese patterns are great. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah, some. exactly. Share. I do have some of yeah, those. Share. If you can figure them out. <laughs> yeah, I know they're pretty complex, they're, simple, they're simple exactly. shapes, minimalist shapes, but very complex patterns. But, yeah. Um, John Marshall that's, that's, also has a book on on um, Japanese patterns, how to make your own Japanese clothes that you can adapt. Oh, cool! Yeah, his videos are so good, and his his site is pretty wild. I love going to check out what he's doing. But yeah, yeah, I well, loved his. You. Uh, thank you so much, Lee. You, you did awesome. I know. You know, we were talking about maybe being a little nervous. You just rocked it. You did yeah. awesome. A natural. You are naturally. Yep, total natural. See? Well, all I right. should be for all these years, right? Of working with yep. Indigo. So anyway, I appreciate y'all again and everyone out there listening. I wish everyone good health and harmony and keep shining that blue light. Okay? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. None of that. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. All right, everyone. We're going to end it a tiny, tiny bit early just because Amy's got a jet. And uh, good luck, Amy. Thanks, you guys. <laughs> All right. Okay, so um, we will see you next time. Let me just tell you really quickly what's happening. Um, just a couple of reminders that uh, we are taking last call for Abu Bakar's latest class, which is working with indigo, but also doing a specific type of stitched resist on strip cloth. Uh, which is also called Fini Mugu, and it is a Dogon style um, uh, patterning. And then the other thing is that we're going to be posting a second class with Porfirio Gutierrez, and that will be on Cochineal. We'll be working with wool fabric this time instead of wool yarns. And um, I keep threatening to do this class on making green. I think we finally nailed a, a date where I actually can prepare for it. And um, there's a bunch of other stuff coming, but we'll put that in our post when we send it. And next week, we have Kristen Arts from Scrambles Quilts in Oakland, California. She is going to be um, giving us an amazing uh, presentation and talk on all sorts of wonderful things that she's working on. Um, those of you who know her, she was at our class in Haystack. She's this lovely, luminous, um, educator. She's worked at the Crucible in Oakland and uh, we're just so pleased to have her. So join us for that. And that's kind of it for today. We're going to unmute to say goodbye and Amy's going to say goodbye first. And uh, then um, Bye, I'll be guys. closing. Bye, Bye guys. So Thank you delicious. again. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye, Bye Amy. Had my love. Bye. Bye guys. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Hi Thank Deanna. You. Hey Hi. Hi Barb. Hi.
Bye. All right, guys. See you all later. Bye. 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 Bye.